<laughs> Welcome to Tony at 12. I'm Tony LeBlanc and today I'm in conversation with Professor Michael Lewis, Head of Portable Antiquities at the British Museum. Our discussion centres around the Bayeux Tapestry. Michael, good to see you. Thank you very Hello, much thanks. for sparing me some time. Yeah, lovely to see you. Good, good. Um, let's start off, uh, you know, I sort of thought to myself, a life of academia, but you wouldn't necessarily agree with that. No, I mean, yeah, I mean, I've kind of gone to a few universities, I suppose, as I've developed um, my kind of different sort of, you know, qualifications, I yeah. guess. Um, I, I sort of started out um, studying history and theology, mm -hmm. then went into the medieval history. Well, it was history and archaeology, and then sort of, yeah, I suppose my PhD had was a history one really but it kind of used quite a few disciplines really so I kind of see myself as well in my day job I'm an archaeologist but I you know I dabble with history and and um, art history also so um, yeah I have a, a kind of view that you kind of have to bring these disciplines together I suppose yeah okay a good all-rounder well I wouldn't say a good all-rounder <laughs> an all-rounder <laughs> an all-rounder yeah Michael um a little bit of background about the British Museum, because I understand it was founded in 1753. So arguably it's a very, very old museum compared with the ones in Exhibition Road. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a it's obviously a big museum. It's been around, as you say, kind of a long time. It's obviously got a very interesting collection. I mean, I work just on British archaeology. Um, so there's some fascinating finds from that period, of course, the Sutton Hoo treasure is probably the most famous. And of course, that sort of touches a little bit on my work, my day to day work, um, which is uh, is about recording archaeological finds made by members of the public. Sutton Hoo was all about coins, wasn't it? It's all about what? Sorry. Coins. Money. Coins, no. Gold. I mean, there, no. There's there's a lot. I mean, there was it was an excavation in 1939 mm -hmm. of a. Of a burial mound um, in in Suffolk, and they excavated several ships' um, graves. The most famous, I suppose, is is the one in in Mound Two, um, and within it there was lots of treasure that was found of all sorts of different sorts of objects, potentially associated with this Anglo-Saxon king named Radwald, who was king of East Anglia. Although they never found any body, um, they just found loads of loads of grave goods. Um, yeah, but it's uh, obviously an amazing sort of discovery. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's obviously on display in the British Museum and it's it's been re-displayed relatively recently, actually. And it's, it's amazing to, to see. It, that's amazing, isn't it? Because you'd normally reckon that probably they'd take the treasure and leave the body. Yeah, well, I think in, in I think in this case, um, the soil is quite acidic in that yeah. area so that probably explains why the, the burials have have gone I mean there's nothing even the bones aren't there. there there's burials in the vicinity that have survived to some extent a bit they're a bit Pompeiish in a way the kind of outlines of them um and you're right in in terms of the other kind of burial mounds they seem to have been completely looted mm. um not quite sure when um and this one's round two there was also an attempt it seems to to try and loot it but they didn't get quite as far as the the burial chamber so you know that's lucky for us of course because um they found some you know very amazing objects so that covers the day job doesn't it well my day job essentially is not quite that actually i mean i manage a, a project to record archaeological finds made by the public across england mm -hmm. and we have um archaeologists called finds liaison officers in that are basically county based whose job it is to to record finds that are found by metal detectorists and others and we log them onto a central database called the port of antiquity scheme database and that enables us as archaeologists to kind of learn about the past essentially um public finds particularly metal detecting finds <coughs> are telling us a different sort of information about the past than we kind of glean through traditional archaeological intervention and indeed my kind of other main research area is looking at finds from the medieval period in particular very interested in what these metal detected finds if you like can add to our, our sort of knowledge of of britain's past how did you get involved with the bio tapestry well yeah i mean the, the bio tapestry is a bit of an odd one really for me because it's it was the subject of my um, phd thesis so it's got nothing to do with my sort of day-to-day -day work um but essentially I think it was probably when I was doing my MA in York that that I kind of got seriously interested in in the tapestry. I did my MA kind of dissertation 
on the fighting men in the Bear Tapestry. I'm not sure it was a very good thesis, but anyway, it got me kind of interested in the tapestry. Um, and then I kind of knew I wanted to do a PhD on the subject. Um, and I was really sort of, um, yeah, I had a very clear idea of what I wanted to do for my thesis. Um, and so I essentially tr tried to find the kind of right supervisor. Um, and, it's, and this was a guy called um, Richard Gameson, who was then based at the University of Kent at Canterbury. So I contacted him and said, look, I've got this idea. Would, could I be your student, essentially? Yeah, yeah. Um, and he said, he said, yeah, that, that would be great. So that thesis really looked at the archaeological aspects of the tapestry. So I suppose drawing together a little bit of my kind of um, interest in um, archaeology, but also with the kind of visual representations of objects. And essentially that thesis um, kind of argued the case um, that the Bayer Tapestry designer wasn't borrowing necessarily from what was real life around them, but from Anglo-Saxon manuscripts and, and later things. Now, uh, other people had, had kind of looked at that to some extent, but I, I kind of looked at it in a lot of depth really to say, well, you know, depending on whether it's realistic or not, or kind of essentially fossilized in art, does that allow us to kind of understand more about the kind of designer and the production of, of the tapestry as well? In terms of the origins, it's believed to have um, started uh, shortly after the conquest. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a little bit of debate about this. I mean, some scholars think that it was kind of started, you know, on the fifteenth of October, ten sixty six. The day but after, was, the, yeah, the day after. But I don't, I don't think it was that quick. Mm. Um, I think a lot of scholars now are kind of, are kind of seeing it as a creation of the kind of um, 1070s, probably between 1072 and 1077 for you know, reasons we can talk about. But um, but yeah, I mean, so it's kind of fairly contemporary, I suppose, is the point um, with the Norman Conquest. So it's not like it's, you know, created many centuries after. Bishop Odo, who was William the Conqueror's brother, um, seems, oh, to brother been, yeah. Yeah, seems to have been quite involved in it. Yes, um, I and mean, again, scholars don't completely agree on who was the, the, the person behind the tapestry. Traditionally, it was always seen that it was Queen Matilda, so um, William the Conqueror's wife. They had this sort of kind of, I suppose, idea that you know she created this artwork um, to kind of impress him. Yeah. Um, which is, is pretty much out of date now. I don't think many people really kind of go with that. There have been a few other people that the tapestry has been sort of identified with, but as you say, Odo, Bishop of Bayer, is the guy who most people think um, is um, the tapestry's patron. And there's there's kind of made lots of different reasons for this, but one of the main ones was that he was made Earl of Kent after the Norman Conquest. So he was in a physically good place to produce something that has um, its origins, which I'm sure we'll talk about in the South East of England. Um, his men also appear, or people identified as his men, identify, you know, have kind of turned up in the, the Bayer tapestry as well. Um, so they're the kind of sort of main reasons, mm. really. But he 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 himself is in it a lot, mm. um, and it's uh, it, it that's kind of very different to most other um, accounts of the Norman Conquest. Odo is in them, but not really. He's not the the star he is of the Bayer tapestry, especially the second half of the tapestry. Who, who designed it? Have you got any theories on that? And who you know effectively was able to tell the story? Yeah, well, we, we're really missing information about the actual d designer um, and, and and how it how it kind of worked. The kind of theory is, and it, I have to say it is a sort of theory, is that the patron Odo may have said roughly kind of what he wanted. Mm. There would have been a designer, we assume to be a, a male, but we might be wrong on that, um, probably from a, a sort of manuscript tradition, so perhaps you know, from a, a, a monastery or such like, the, the best bet seem to be St. Augustine's um, in Canterbury or Christchurch in Canterbury because some of the Anglo-Saxon um, manuscripts that seem to have influenced the tapestry are from there. Um, so he's he, so that's the kind of designer. The, my kind of thinking is that he would have sort of sketched out the, the, the basic mm. idea and design, um, and then it would have sort of been handed over to embroiderers to, to finish. My theory is that the, the designer really didn't kind of get too much involved after they'd done the sketching work, if you like. Yeah. yeah. Um, but they may have done, but 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 it we don't know. But it, to me, it seems sort of un, unlikely, really. Um, so what's interesting about that, of course, is the embroiderers then 
have potentially quite a, a kind of inferential hand in mm. the creation of the work. Yeah. So, I mean, it was a bit like in the movies, they use storyboards, don't they, to show the basic sequences. So it's a little bit like that, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I guess Sodo is a busy man, and you know, yeah. apart from saying that I want to be a star of this, um, I don't think he's really going to look at it from, <laughs> from day to day and say, "Oh, I'm not sure about this bit and that bit." I mean, perhaps I'm wrong, of course, um, but but that's my sort of inkling. I think um, the way it kind of works in terms of Anglo-Saxon manuscripts is they would have been handed over to individuals who are the creative part to kind of yeah. deal with them, and then even within manuscript scriptorium, you know, they may have handed over other bits of work to other people to kind of do the detail. And one thing I probably should have said, or more clearly said, is embroiderers are almost certainly women. Yeah. Um, and um, we don't know much about them, but in some of the, the source material, um, it's fairly clear that a lot of women at this time that are mentioned doing embroidery are high status. But I think that a wider kind of echelon, if you like, or sense of society would have been part of that as well. I think all women, at this period would have been pretty good at doing textile work it was a a, a common thing whether they all did embroidery is another sort of matter mm. really yeah um, yeah tell me do you think it was a propaganda instrument up to a point well a lot we, of we people, won and you lost <laughs> yeah i mean a lot of people really take that view that it's yeah. a piece of Roman propaganda yeah but actually the tar the tapestry story which isn't just about the Battle of Hastings, it's about all of the events that lead up to the Norman Conquest. Although it has a, um, a, a bias, there's no doubt about that, it kind of leaves out information. It's not like it really rubs it in, in terms of Harold. Yeah. So Harold is shown in the tapestry, you know, relatively favorably in a way. I mean, he's shown as a, a man of status, he's shown as being acknowledged as king, he's shown as, you know, people being loyal to him, as, essentially. He even undertakes a, a um a piece of rescuing so there's a scene where some normans are drowning in the river Cousson when they go on campaign to Brittany which Harold had joined William on and um Harold is shown there kind of rescuing two men one you know kind of under his his arm and the other one he's kind of got on his shoulder sort of thing dragging them from these quicksands so not only is it showing him as being brave but also um being quite strong as well and of course at the battle of Hastings he's shown dying and um it's not like he runs off the battlefield when it all gets a bit kind of it's a bit, bit difficult he kind of stays there to the, to the very end so I think um the tapestry in answer to your question has a fairly balanced sort of view um but it is very much a story between two men yeah um William and and Harold whereas in reality this it was it's a much more complicated um succession sort of um question than that there was lots of people sort of gunning for England um at this time on the on the on the occasion of Ed, Edward the Confessor's death the dimensions are incredible. <clears throat> I first saw it in the 1980s and I was thinking it was going to be a floor to ceiling job. <laughs> but in actual fact, nearly 70 metres long, um, 50 centimetres high, 70 metres, three cricket pitches to put it into perspective. It's, it's quite incredible from that point of view. Um, I suppose from their point of view, in terms of constructing it, it was a lot easier to do it on a fairly, um, what should we say, uh, modest height, as it were. Yeah, I mean, like you say, it's impressively long. And when you go and see it, or if you go and see it in Bayer, that, you know, that's the first thing that strikes you is this, gosh, this thing goes on. And then you realise you're actually only seeing half of it because it bends back on itself in its current displaced case. And the narrowness is, is important as well. Yes, I mean, I think there's there's reasons why it's like that. And that's what one of them is essentially from a production perspective. Um, it would have been easier to kind of put together relatively narrow strips of, of, of linen uh, and join them together. Um, it's not being produced on a loom, of course, like a, um, a tapestry and generally speak. So it's not it's an embroidery work. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and embroidery. Um, generally speaking use use frames for those so i think there's something about using a frame that might sort of dictate the height not necessarily mm. the length. so i think um yeah so i think there's there's reasons in terms of the production but also of course the the scale of it means that there it could have been created in in various sorts of ways i mean you could have just started at the beginning and gone right through but of course it's composed of different linen lengths that have been joined together and then embroidered and some people have suggested that they may have been created in different workshops i don't agree with that myself but no. um 
but the but the point is you know there's there's various ways this could have been constructed and we really don't understand that completely i mean apart <clears throat> apart from the sheer size <clears throat> we we've got 58 scenes depicted in there <clears throat> so uh <clears throat> that in itself is quite something yeah i think i mean the, the the point about the scenes is a bit odd in a way because these these are dictated by the fact that there's been numbers put on the fabric in a later period not we're not quite sure when that happened probably in the 19th century but um those those figures they, they've seen numbers if you like of you know they, they make sense yeah but they're they're a modern kind of construct if you like in terms of understanding the tapestry and the different phases and i suppose they are quite useful to us because we can say in scene 52 this is happening and you know in scene 14 that's yeah. happening so it's yeah. quite useful from a, uh, a talking about it because um yeah all the, the characters aren't named and stuff and so picking them out can be quite tricky um apart from odo but it yeah apart from odo. <laughs> but, it, but it does get but it does um yeah but it it is it is you know quite busy actually um and it's more congested the tapestry earlier on so it, even just counting those scene numbers which like i said are kind of you know make us think of it in a slightly different way to perhaps the people at the time even so you kind of see that a lot more action is happening earlier on and then it mm. sort of peters out and the scenes get kind of longer if you like um so it sort of suggests that the the the, the process was being sped up a little bit um, do, do, do you think that possibly um, different people were doing different bits at different times and it had to be edited together? Yeah, I mean, that's what some people think. I don't kind of go with that. I kind of feel that, um, I mean, it may be that the, the lengths were all, were all drawn out. Yeah. And it might be that they did work on, you know, two bits at, at different kind of places within a single workshop. I mean, maybe even more, but I think, you know, as we've talked about the size of it, you start to get into the, the issue of how many people can you have on this working at once and where is it all going to happen? Mm. Um, and actually, you know, the kind of idea that it might have happened in um, inside or outside is quite interesting, actually. So inside, of course, you're limited by the daylight and the time of the year by how much time you can spend on it. I don't think really people would want to be doing this. They could have done it, but I don't think they we'd really be wanting to do this under artificial light, i.e. candlelight. Yeah. yeah. Um, and obviously, so the summer months and obviously outside is the sort of ideal place, isn't it? You know, because you can, and as long as it's not raining, of course. Mm. Um, so I, so you kind of, yeah, it, there's a lot of, there's a lot of possibilities, I suppose, is the, is the point. And um, yeah, I kind of feel that we, we could learn, you know, more about that in the future, perhaps. Are you aware of any of the scenes having been altered from the time it was constructed? I mean, I was talking to you yesterday about Coventry, whereby with the Reformation, suddenly the Catholic influence is wiped out in a scene and the Protestant influence is put in. Are we aware of any changes that were made? Yes, but not quite in that sort of sense. So mm -hmm. sense what happened is the tapestry clearly got damaged um, probably in the, the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, and in the early uh, 19th century, um, a scholar from the Society of Antiquities of London, um, Charles Stottard, was sent out to, to do a, make a drawing of the tapestry. And he obviously records the tapestry in its state and it shows that there's, there's parts that are damaged. Yeah. Uh, subsequently, the tapestry was restored. Um, and it seems what happened is, is um, probably what happened, we don't know for certain, that um, people use Stottard's drawings because he also indicated where needle holes were that he could see. So he sort of reconstructs in his drawings parts of the scenes. One of the most famous, of course, is Harold being shot in an arrow in the eye. So if you look at the earlier drawings of the tapestry, so before Charles Stottard, um, it's fairly clear that some of these dots aren't joined up. And then Stottard does join them up based on his knowledge of what he thinks happened. Um, so for example, in the case of... You there? You there, Michael? Thank you. Okay, so um, having looked at that aspect, um, it seemed to me that between 1066 and I think 1476, you know, it, it just sort of had this void. What was that all about? 
Yeah, so we don't really know um, anything about the Bayer Tapestry until it's, you know, for certain, yeah. until it's mentioned in this inventory of the cathedral treasures, as you say, to the late kind of 15th century. And we've got no idea, essentially, what may have happened. The, the sort of kind of the thought, I suppose, is that the tapestry probably came to Bayer in about 1077, because that was when Bayer Cathedral got consecrated. Mm -hmm. um, people like the idea that tapestry could have been made for display in the cathedral, but it could have just been presented as a gift, like lots of kind of diplomatic things are, and, and hold up in the treasury. And that's my sort of inkling, really. And that sort of probably explains why the tapestry survives in such a good condition that it was, you know, hold, you know, is basically presented to the cathedral, put into the treasury and sort of forgotten about for, for years and years and years. And then suddenly, for some reason, I don't really know why, um, in the late 15th century, they decide they're going to stick it out and put it on display around the cathedral. And they say that they do this at the time of the Feast of Relics, which is in about July time each year for a couple of weeks. Yeah. And they hang it around the cathedral. Um, as part of that sort of festival. Um, then we don't know anything again more about the Bayer Tapestry for certain until um, the early 18th century when some French historians um, realised that there's something that could exist in Bayer Cathedral that could be useful for them in terms of, in terms of telling a story of the French monarchy. Mm -hmm. um, and investigations are sort of made they're kind of sent away saying we don't know anything like this um essentially they're working off a drawing that they don't know whether it's of a tapestry or a piece a piece of um sculpture or it's just a small part of the tapestry yeah. essentially yeah. that they've been shown a picture of if you like um and then eventually they're told oh maybe we do have something like this and then suddenly everybody gets kind of quite excited about it and particularly um on in england where there's lots of people sort of realise that this could be really important for understanding um, 1066 and all that. Is it true <laughs> that during the French Revolution, it was actually ripped down and used to cover wagons? Well, there was there were there were various um, kind of conflicts and and things, and there was a it it wasn't actually used to cover wa wagons. There was a so it was I think it was more there was um in the kind of in in the um religious wars of France that there was this idea that the tapestry could be quite a useful wagon cover and the, the authorities of Bayer did intervene and, and kind of um, say that's probably not a great idea that can't you use something else so it was almost cut up um, for, yeah. for that purpose but it, but it never happened actually um, but yes I mean there was obviously lots of kind of trouble in in France I mean actually in the Napoleonic Wars um, Napoleon was quite interested in the Bayer Tapestry and he had it moved to Paris for display um, because he was thinking about invading England yeah. um, and he thought it might be a nice thing to kind of, to show, <laughs> Probably, to kind of rally the troops. Like. But, it, yeah. but it didn't really get, it didn't really get, um, get anywhere that time. <clears throat> but the, there have been instances during its history where it has had to be rolled up and hidden. What about yes. World War II? Yeah, I mean, the Second World War is, is really interesting, actually because um, um, there was, within the German state, there were, there were different bodies that are interested in works of art for various reasons. The two kind of important ones were one that was interested in protecting work of art in places which the Germans um, invaded. And the second one was about uh, understanding the origins of Germanic peoples <coughs> through material culture. Yeah. Again, you know, quite, you know, as we we would think, you know, kind of a worry, very worrying way of looking at the past in terms of, you know, creating um, reasons why you should occupy all of these countries that you've then gone and occupied. The, the Germans were really interested in the Bayer Tapestry because of its, um, because the Normans had Viking origins. Yeah. And they yeah. obviously saw them as sort of Nordic people, in essence, or Germanic peoples. Um, and they they sent a research team to study the Bayer Tapestry, um, and they did some amazing research, which was never properly published, but it is quite well known about. Um, and they brought together lots of leading minds from German universities who were experts on things like clothing, warfare, armor, embroidery, and they photographed it and they did you know loads of research. Um, but like I said, it never came to anything. Then, of course, when um, there was a sense that Normandy was going to be threatened by an allied invasion. The Bayer Tapestry was moved to um, from its, its its stores, if you like, in 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 northern France. Sorry, in Normandy, um, and then taken to um, the the um, to Paris um, in the Louvre there. Um, and it's understood that when Paris was on the the verge of being um, uh, liberated, that the um, German High Command, essentially Henrik Himmler himself 
um, asked that the Bayer tapestry be taken out of Paris and transferred to Germany um, for safekeeping. Um, yeah. and he, was, he was quite interested in all these sorts of yeah, objects. Yeah, yeah, well, of course. Yeah. Um, but um, when the, the SS troops arrived um, to the commandant who's in charge and said, you know, we've come to collect their tapestry, he basically said, well, if you like, you can go and do that. But the Louvre's just been taken over by the Americans now. So it might be a bit of a tricky task. So, sorry, chaps, you're a bit late. A bit late. Yes, they were a bit late. I mean, who knows what would have happened then, of course. Um, you know, they, they, uh, were, they were quite famous, though, Michael, for looting tre art treasures, weren't they? The Nazis. Yes, of course, and um, and and you know, like I said, there were very diff there was various different reasons for that. Some were to do with understanding the kind of origins of the Germanic peoples, and others was because they just prized um, these these sort of works of arts. Yeah. And of course, you know, you can see looking at the Bayer tapestry that it is, you know, is obviously a, um, quite a you know an amazing survival of this period of history where we don't really get that much um material culture in, in this sort of way surviving that's what of course makes the tapestry so amazing really that it's such a um a colorful and animated um story of history whereas if i mean my my colleagues who research manuscripts get quite upset about this but you know, when you read things like William of Poitiers and the anglo-saxon chronicle they get a bit boring at some points um the yeah. tapestry engages everyone i think <laughs> yes, absolutely. You just keep walking around it. Um, it's obviously quite a fragile work. Uh, what what attempts, if any, have been made to uh, um, to conserve it over and above what we see at the moment? Yeah, so 1982, there was a, a conservation campaign because the tapestry was being moved to its current um, exhibition place. Um, and since then, um, there's a there's been there's there are plans which and, and I'm involved with these um, to look at how the tapestry could be redisplayed in the future. Yeah. There's a couple of things that are motivating this. One is the fact that, as you know, the tapestry goes back on itself, so it would be nice to be able to show it in one continuous kind of length. Yeah. Um, there are kind of understandings that the tapestry is probably not as well displayed as it sort of could be. You know, obviously technology has moved along, so it's not blaming anyone for how it's displayed now, but our understanding of how objects kind of react to um, being displayed in particular ways and all of that sort of stuff. Also, it's not that easy to um, remove the tapestry from its case as well. So um, if that had to happen, it would be more difficult than it could be. So all of that has sort of led really to the idea that the tapestry could be re-exhibited in a, a, a new museum. And also not only about the tapestry itself, but how the tapestry story is told to the various different types of people that come and visit it. So obviously lots of people come from, um, from Britain, but there's also people from France and you know other European countries, even farther afield as, as well. And they want different things from that. For us in England, it's very much about 1066 and the yeah. Norman Conquest, but for other people, you know, this is this is just an example of of a work of art from the medieval period that tells a story that some of them don't really know that well. Um, so the tapestry displays have to talk to that kind of wide ranging audience, really. Um, but yes, I mean, as part of that work, there's there's a plan to do some major um, conservation work of the tapestry. Um, what's sort of happened is we talked about some of the the changes that have been made to the embroidery in terms of the um, the restorations that were made in the 19th century um, and there's different backings that have been added to it over time as well and these mean that the tapestry fibres are kind of all fighting each other mm. I mean, you know a conservator will tell you that it's impossible um, to reverse um, that process of, of of degrading we all degrade every organic object does yeah sure. about how you kind of reduce <clears throat> that as much mm. as possible can anyone put a value on it or is it priceless Certainly priceless, I think. Um, I don't think, it, I mean, I, I wonder if anybody has tried to value it in terms of, kind yeah, of insurance yeah. purposes. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, obviously it's beyond money. If it was to be lost, that would be it really. I mean, you couldn't replace it in any sort no. of sense at all, can you? No. Um, you find the French are very cooperative in terms of, you know, the, the conquered coming along and giving them a bit of advice from an academic <laughs> point of view. Yeah, I mean, I think we have quite a, um, a good, um, you know the, the members of the committee you know are all interested in the same thing yeah essentially uh, you know how do we uh, ensure that this this object is you know survives as long as possible and how do we ensure that as many people as possible can see it and engage with it and understand it sort of those things so we're, i think we're all in a, a similar sort of mind 
obviously the processes um, for doing things in France are different to what I'm used to in England. Yeah. Um, they, they have much more stages, I would say, to their, their kind of processes. Um, so, you know, from my perspective, it's trying to get my head around, you know, that and, and how, how they do things. Um, but yeah, essentially, I think we all want the same thing, really. Um, and that's for this, this amazing object to, to continue to tell these, these amazing stories and inspire people to be interested in this period of history. Now, we can't stop. Uh, we've got to talk about the Albany edition before we finish this interview, haven't we? What do you yes. think about that? Well, yeah, I, I mean, I, it, I, it was the first time I saw that. Um, when was that? On uh, Monday. Yeah. Um, so a couple of days ago. And um, yeah, I mean, it's just it's just an amazing um, sort of creation. So I've seen a few kind of community projects that have been influenced by the Bear Tapestry, um, including the Battle Tapestry. And there's one that's been created in Norwich as well. But of course, the Alderney Tapestry is the one that kind of tells the, the, the you know the potential end of what we have. So we've we've talked about the fact that you know the Bear Tapestry suddenly ends at the at, after the Battle of Hastings, and then what happens next? Mm. So, so for me, I love you know I find it really interesting from a personal perspective because um, it's not only what it shows, but how did the people who made that. Um, or involved with its creation come to those kind of thoughts about about it as well and you know what sort of decisions they made and particularly I, I get I got quite excited about the borders because they started inventing and doing new things in the borders that we don't find in the Bay of Tapestry so you know what is the motivation for doing those aspects so for me I suppose they just kind of help kind of provide mm. a few a few clues to about how the people of the past might have felt or did things um, in terms of the the the, the original bear tapestry. And but of I course, love seeing it. it. It's it's got raw stitches in it. Yeah, has it? <laughs> well, you know, the king and the queen consort. Oh, I see um, more yeah, people yeah, adding yeah, to it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, maybe we don't know actually, do we? I mean, maybe the bear tapestry is a big community project. Well, that's what. And I'm maybe wondering. William had a go. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, it's been a great pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for sparing me some time. And um, you know, it's uh, very informative, and it's a very, very interesting subject, no doubt about that. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure.